Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. The sound of water gently lapping the shore. In the distance, birds chirp their morning song. A peaceful lake where nature is working in complete harmony. But about 40 years ago, just below the surface, a tiny creature was introduced into the scene and it started multiplying at a rapid rate. They're being called the cockroach of the Great Lakes because they spread in hordes and are almost impossible to get rid of. I'm journalist Erica Vella. And in this episode, we look at a tiny mollusk that has forever changed the ecosystem in parts of Canada and beyond. This is What Happened to Zebra Mussels. The freshwater mollusks are about the size of a fingernail, and the distinctive dark stripes that zigzag over their shell give it their name. They're now found in lakes in different parts of Canada and the U.S., but they're not originally from here. They are native to the sort of southeastern Europe the Caspian Sea, Black Sea area, and the Russia, Ukraine sort of area. That's Gregory Bolte. He's a biology instructor at Carleton University, and he has spent years studying the tiny mollusks' impact. So zebra mussels are fairly small, and the way they reproduce is that they release, female release eggs, males release sperms in the water, they meet one another and then they produce these tiny little larvae called villagers and those are very plank they're planktonic we can barely you can't really see them with a naked eye and so these can be floating in the water by the millions and so they got into the ballast of shipping boats and so when these boats coming from europe would get into the great lake and dump their ballast water when they would put their cargo in, there would be some of these little villager in there, and they eventually managed to, uh, enough of them got introduced that they managed to establish themselves in, in North America. They were introduced into the Great Lakes in the 80s. They're being called the cockroach of the Great Lakes because they spread in hordes and are almost impossible to get rid of. Lately, the zebra mussels have been moving twice as fast as predicted. To try to control zebra mussel, is an impossibility. Uh, uh, Every single female puts out a million eggs each summer, and um, you can't control a species like that. Brooke Schreier is the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. He grew up on Lake Scugog in Ontario, and in the 90s, he recalls a particular fall when he was five years old. When we pulled the boat out of the water, we noticed that it was, well, first of all, probably double uh, its normal weight because of just the sheer abundance of zebra mussels that had clung to the bottom of the boat. It, it was almost grotesque, to be honest. Um, and these things are, are you know, crazy in the respect of, of how they can colonize a surface. You can't even see the boat. You know, every surface of that boat that was underwater was then subsequently covered in zebra mussels. That day, they cleared the pesky little mollusks off the boat and carried on. But soon, the lake they loved began to change, and it was all because of zebra mussels. Gregory Bolte says that the key to understanding their impact is knowing how the tiny mollusks eat. It's quite remarkable how how they've changed everything. And in fact, they, they get the name of ecosystem engineers because they can really completely change and reconfigure an entire ecosystem. They pump water through an opening. There's also little food particles, little planktons, little little bits of algae, and little micro animals, and they capture those and feed on these things. So they're capable of removing a lot of the things that are suspended in the water column. So we see they're filter feeders because of that. And and when you multiply, you know, every single muscle doesn't filter a whole lot of water. But when you have huge densities of, you know, hunt tens or sometimes hundreds of thousands of them per meter square, they can actually clean up the water column pretty quickly. I'm going to jump in here for a moment. You heard Gregory just mention the water column. That's basically the space between the surface of the water and the bottom sediment. And you'll hear that term throughout the episode. Gregory says the zebra mussels live in relatively shallow water. And that's because that's where the, the phytoplankton, the little algae that are floating in the water column are. So 
they're going to be sucking up that food source and bringing it down to, to the bottom. And so that increases the clarity of the water. So now there's more light penetration. So there's more places, for instance, that plants can grow. They've changed that. They've changed the depth at which we find plants in, in freshwater ecosystem. But it also bring all that food near the bottom. So now there's less food in the water column for things like zooplankton. Like imagine like these little you know, miniature crustaceans, water fleas and so on that feed on these little algae that are floating around. So these things now are declining. So the fish that rely on these uh, on these food sources are also declining. But now we have more food at the bottom. So things that feed near the bottoms, a lot of things like snails, for instance, uh, certain other crustaceans, now have more nutrients in food source at the bottom. So we see all these shifts in where the food is and who feeds on what. Native species like freshwater clams living in the Great Lakes are one of the species impacted by zebra mussels. There you go, here's a, here's a clam. The Lampcellus radiata, it's covered with zebra mussels, as you can see. This is, this is pretty typical for what you find when you get into the lake. These clams will start, probably start dying off next year. You probably have trouble finding them in about a year, two years in time. Zebra mussels like to attach to hard things, hard substrate. So sometimes in soft bottom lakes or soft bottom rivers, you'd have these really nice beds of native mussels. And these, these, these big native mussels, they move around. They're not attached to anywhere. So, um, and so the zebra mussels would attach to them because they would be one of the hard <laughs> things around. Um, and, then, and then they would filter the food that the big native mussels are trying to get, but also they would impede with their locomotion. Gregory says we are now seeing other invasive species thriving off the conditions created by zebra mussels. Around Gobi, also an invasive fish from the same part of the world as the zebra mussel, is an example of this. So that's a little fish, a bottom-feeding fish, now was introduced to North America, and all of a sudden it found one of favorite food source in uh, at the bottom of lakes. So these little fish now are feeding on zebra mussels. And now we see species that feed on fish, for instance, things like cormorants, for instance, native birds, uh, now feed almost exclusively on round gobies. So it, it completely changed the dynamic. The birds eat the round goby, which makes them susceptible to other bacteria and parasites. So um, there is a type of botulism that affects aquatic birds. So botulism is caused as a toxin, uh, it's caused by a toxin produced by a bacteria. That bacteria lives in sediments where there's no oxygen, so at the bottom. So before we had uh, zebra mussels, there's uh, birds in the Great Lakes were not greatly affected by botulism because they were not really feedings on, feeding on fish that were connected to the bottom. Now, we have zebra mussels that are bringing all these nutrients towards the bottom. We have round gobies that are feeding near the bottom. Now we have the toxin of, of that bacteria that makes its way into zebra mussels and then into round gobies and then into birds. And so there's evidence that um, there's been some big die off of birds in the Great Lakes that might have been caused indirectly because of zebra mussels. This is just one example of the devastating impacts invasive species have on the ecosystem. And Gregory says the mollusks are also responsible for blocking and damaging crucial infrastructure, not just ecosystems. It was a problem that gained a lot of attention back in the 90s. About a mile out there in Lake Ontario, at the end of the intake pipe for the R.L. Clark filtration plant, the first signs of zebra mussels were spotted about two weeks ago. The plant is one of four supplying water in Metro. And unless something's done fairly quickly, the mussels could pose a real threat. They would diminish the uh, diameter of the, the pipe. That would limit, start to limit the flow into the plant. And uh, also, as they progressed through their growing stages and eventually died off, there's a potential they could cause some taste and odor problems in the water entering the plant. And soon, zebra mussels would be found in other water bodies in Canada and the U.S. I think one of the unique things about zebra mussels is how they're moving between lakes, especially lakes that aren't connected from rivers. And you can think of lakes like islands in a way, is that how would zebra mussels move between lakes when, when there's no obvious pathway for them? And it's because they're extremely good hitchhikers. That's Scott Higgins. 
He's a research scientist with the IISD Experimental Lakes. In addition to them growing on hard rocky lake bottoms or hard surfaces, they can also grow on plants. Uh, and when recreational boaters back their boats, their boat trailers into, uh, into a boat launch uh, and pull that boat trailer out, that boat trailer can often uh, tear out aquatic plants and the zebra mussel hitchhikers with them. Scott says because these villagers are not visible to the naked eye, they can live in water intakes on boats and watercraft, and that allows them to travel great distances. It only took a few years for them to move from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River drainage, over a thousand kilometers down to the Gulf of Mexico, and start spreading into, you know, lakes in the in the Mississippi River watershed and further. Uh, they move very, very quickly. Um, and so I think by that time, the horse was out of the barn. It was very challenging now for, for lake managers and lake policymakers to eradicate them. And it might not have even made sense to try to eradicate them in the in the Laurentian Great Lakes, where they would simply be reintroduced every year. Zebra mussels never left, and other invasive species have since arrived, including the zebra mussel's cousin, the coaga mussel. The Great Lakes is the most invaded freshwater system on the planet. No other system, no other freshwater system, has been invaded as often or at the rate at which the Great Lakes has been invaded. That's Anthony Ricciardi. He's an environmental science and biology professor at McGill University, and he has spent decades studying aquatic invasive species. His research found that from 1959 to 2006, aquatic invasive species were an ongoing threat to the biodiversity of the Great Lakes. And in fact, one new invading species was discovered every six to seven months on average. These are not isolated events. These are not unrelated. They are all symptomatic of a form of human-driven global change. Under human influence, because of our activities, species are moving faster, farther, and in far greater numbers than ever before. And every region of the planet, including the polar regions, including mountain, mountainous areas, are affected because of what we're doing. This is unprecedented. We can't afford to keep putting out these biological fires. So what we need to do is control the vectors, that is the transportation systems that brought them in in the first place, that allow them to hitchhike. When zebra mussels and other species arrived in the Great Lakes in the 1980s, it prompted the Canadian government to take action. Ballast water was recognized as a key problem because 65% of invasive species found in the Great Lakes have been linked to ballast water releases. So at the time, Um, it was recognized that there are more species that could come from Europe this way, unless something was done about it. So they said, okay, we will introduce some measures. In 1989, they were voluntary at first, put forward by the uh, the government of Canada. And that was to ask um, uh, the shipping industry uh, with respect to overseas ships coming through the St. Lawrence Seaway to exchange their water on the high seas Uh, prior to entering the seaway. The idea was that any freshwater um, organisms in the ballast tanks would either be flushed out or purged, or they would be killed on contact with the seawater and anything coming into the seawater. Anthony said it didn't work, even though the U.S. and Canada made it mandatory by 1993. It didn't seem to work because other things came in anyway. Um, Other species that were a little bit more salinity tolerant, so they might survive an incomplete ballast water exchange where there's a mixture of fresh water and, and, and salt water. And a lot of other sh- main reason they didn't work is because a lot of ships were declaring that they had no pumpable ballast on board when they had ballast on board. And so they were deemed to be not covered by the regulation. So scientists began working on a better way to stop invasive species from coming in. A new technique proved to be more effective basically the same as ballast water exchange, except it was called swish and spit. It was saltwater flushing. So a continuous flushing of the tanks until, sea, the, until the salinity in the tanks was equivalent to seawater, all right, which most freshwater species cannot endure. In 2006, Canada passed new legislation and the U.S. followed in 2008 with harmonized legislation. Um, this was an altered form of the previous method uh, and it was applied to all incoming ships, not just some of them, all of them. And with inspection, every ship was inspected. 
So there was enforcement. This is important. So what we've seen is that what was once the highest invasion rate of any freshwater system in the world has now collapsed. It's not zero, but it has fallen by 80, more than 85%. No other time in the history of the Great Lakes, because it's well documented, the history of invasion of the Great Lakes, has, has that ever happened? No other time has... This legislation was a direct result of a collaboration of scientists, the shipping industry, and the Canadian and American governments. But though it's helped greatly, it's never going to stop all future invasive species from entering the ecosystem by other vectors. We'll never know what we've kept up, just like any kind of national security or biosecurity. We don't. We have an idea what's moving around out there. We have a good idea. We don't know when they would have invaded. Just think of it again as spinning a roulette wheel. The more that this is happening, the more chance that one of those will be the next biological fire that will cost us. And once it rages, it's very difficult to put out and it's almost impossible to remove. Not always impossible, it depends on the system. And the Great Lakes, they're largely impossible to get rid of once they're in there. We haven't seen the last of the species that could invade the Great Lakes. There's many, many that could do so. So that ballast water intervention was necessary. And in the Great Lakes can still be invaded by other things and will be especially as climate change proceeds, unless we get a handle on some of this. Live trade is the one that I would point to, the movement of species through commerce that could end up accidentally or deliberately being put into into Great Lakes space. We have to keep an eye on that. In Canada, zebra mussels remain one of six prohibited species under the Federal Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations. The mussels continue to spread to other Western provinces. As we mentioned, they've been found as far south as the Mississippi River watershed. Remember, these mollusks originally come from regions in southeastern Europe, so they are really, really far from home. Anthony says it's nearly impossible to stop zebra mussels once they've established themselves. They're here already, so that fire is already raging. It's moving out west. And then it will start a big fire there if it gets, and that's why we, you know Western provinces are, con- especially BC, are concerned, and Western uh, states, United States, are concerned, and rightly so, but zebra and quagga mussels, because they seen them, at, they seen them at the borders, attached to recreational boats and yachts. Meanwhile, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada said in a statement that the government of Canada is committed to the protection of fish and their habitat, including combating aquatic invasive species. They say they are working closely with the Canada Border Services Agency to improve enforcement of the aquatic invasive species regulations at international borders. A pilot project is underway at an international border crossing in Manitoba to ensure watercraft entering Canada are zebra mussel free by checking boats to see if they've been cleaned, drained, and dried to prevent organisms from being inadvertently imported. There are also other efforts for early detection, inspection and decontamination set up in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta to help prevent the spread of zebra mussels across inland waters in Canada. And as Anthony mentioned, British Columbia has also set up inspections. Watercraft that move into BC waters like sailboats, motorboats, kayaks, canoes, and paddle boats are required to stop at an open inspection station or face steep fines. A report was even released that looked at inspection results. And of the 33,000 inspections in 2021, 17 were confirmed to be carrying the mussels. Scott Higgins says that while the government interventions help, there are things we can do to also stop the spread. Enforcement and legislation uh, are very important. Um, And they sort of set the rules about um, behaviors and and how we how we deal with zebra mussels. For instance, uh, it is illegal to transport invasive species now between water bodies. And there is an onus on individuals to to ensure that their boats or other watercraft are cleaned and decontaminated before they do so. And so it is really important that individuals who who use lakes and recreate on lakes really take this issue seriously uh, and ensure that they're not transporting zebra mussels to, to new lakes. Brooke Schreier, who is the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, recommends that if something seems unusual or out of the norm, report it 
because monitoring lakes helps find new potential threats. If one person sees something that shouldn't be there and they know what they're looking at, that is the easiest way to, to address something before it becomes established, right? Um, so by raising that overall level, that baseline knowledge around invasive species and um, identification, you know, what you're really trying to do is encourage people to, to take photographs, to report them uh, so they can track their occurrences, whether it's a species that's been here a while or a new detection, in hopes that if there is, you know, let's say a species that's already found itself in Ontario and it, it all of a sudden appears way off the grid in an area where it never appeared before, that maybe we can do something about it. And that's called early detection and rapid response, right? We'll be adding links to reporting websites that track invasive species in North America, websites like www.eddmaps.org. It will be available in our show notes. So if you see something, take a photo and submit it. Zebra mussels change the ecosystem of Ontario's lakes and beyond, and we're unlikely to return to the way things were ever again. But at least we can learn from the past and avoid further invasions in the future by taking responsibility for our ecosystems and the native species within them. Thank you for joining me this week. Global News What Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Vela, with producer Dila Velezquez. Our audio producers are Rosalind Kufour and Rob Johnson. A special thanks goes to Drew Hasselbeck, supervising national online journalist for Global News. Let us know what you thought of this episode and please share it with a friend. It will help us grow the show and bring you more incredible stories. You can also help us out by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also reach out to me personally. We are always looking for stories, so if there's a new story you want us to revisit, you can reach me on Twitter at Erica Bella or email me at erica.bella at globalnews.ca. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.